Quadruple UDC will be 24 hours old because it's 10.41 a.m. It's going to be 10 a.m. on Monday. Today's Tuesday. We got less than a week until all of our dreams are crushed. And I'm very, very excited, mainly because there's potentially going to be hardware at this event. And if it's the next generation of Apple Silicon, if it's the M1X chip of any kind, I'm very, very excited to see how far Apple can take it. Bloomberg has talked about M1X having eight high-performance cores. All of the craziness of the M1 has been achieved with four. Now we're going to be doubling that up and seeing what it's like. On top of that, I have insanely high um, wishes. I don't want to use the word expectations because I'm going into this expecting Apple to not really do what I want iPadOS to be capable of. Mainly because over the past week, as I've been using this mini LED iPad Pro, there have been countless situations I, I would say probably <laughs> as i say countless what i mean is like five or six but still just in someone like me who who does you know professional grade video editing but i think it's safe to say my tech videos are not insanely like high-end edits there's there's lots of jump cuts there's some text throw in there's some intros there's some music um and all these situations that i wanted the m1 ipad pro to fit into my ecosystem we're all limited by iPadOS, not third-party applications. The limit was not Streamlabs. The limit was not uh, LumaFusion. The third parties are doing the very best they can, but iPadOS was ultimately always the limiting factor. And of course, I wish iPadOS would get much, much better so that it could take advantage of this incredible hardware that it, it has inside it. Seriously, like, I don't think we give enough credit because, you know, mini LED iPad Pro is kind of the star of the show. Everybody just basically wants to talk about the fact that this has, you know, extreme dynamic range and we've never really had mini LED on an Apple product before. So obviously this takes a lot of the attention and a lot of people dwell on this. But the truth is, even that 11-inch model got upgraded. That is an $800 device. All-in-one computer, right? This is an $800 computer with Face ID, with 120 hertz, with two rear-facing cameras and LiDAR, with a Thunderbolt port and the M1 chip, which has the fastest single-core performance of, I believe, any processor, really, that's available to consumers. Um, single core. Okay, we're talking multi core is a different story for sure. My iMac Pro beats the M1 in multi core, but if we're just talking about Apple Silicon and how it destroys the competition, that is an $800 tablet with an insane amount of performance, great display. I know it's not mini LED, it's not a liquid retina XDR or anything like that, but it's still an incredible value for $800, but that huge limiting factor that all of us just can't get around that prevents it from being a Mac replacement or a laptop replacement for so many people is simply just iPad OS. And that's so frustrating to me that there's so much limitations that come with software. Um, top end Ryzen nines are slightly faster on single core, but way higher. Watt. Yeah, I'm sure they consume way more power. Um, but still, I just think there's so much potential with the iPad that's untapped. And it's it it's fair to say, yeah, it's been that way for a while. You know, like A12X and A12Z processors were probably not entirely utilized by iPad OS for the past two, three years that it's been available on the 2018 iPad Pros. Um, even the A10X chip was pretty overkill uh, for what the iPad was capable of doing. Um, but yeah, I, I still stand by my point that iPad OS, when it comes to the software, has to be the main focus. I think that is where the most amount of overhaul and the most amount of tension is well overdue. Um, Mac OS, I really don't have many suggestions for other than just more stability. And um, notifications on Mac OS Big Sur are a little bit clunky to me. That like Just the process of uh, replying to messages and that kind of thing and having to hover over it to hit the X and dismiss them is just a little clunky. Um, there's little tweaks here and there I have uh, for Mac OS, but um, let's see. Yoris says, the M1 is just so good, I couldn't believe how well it sips my at MacBook Air. <laughs> I was incredibly impressed with it. I think if you're in the market for a Mac, the M1 MacBook Air was like the best value for performance available. Like that was unmatched. Um, considering it's an all-in-one, technically. We call the iMac an all-in-one, but the truth is laptops and iPads are technically all-in-ones because you can take them out of the box 
and just start using them. The Mac Mini is not an all-in-one um, because you have to supply your own keyboard, mouse, and monitor. And there's obviously a tremendous amount of value there, assuming you have all those other things, which many do. Like, I would still opt for an M1 just because I'm a, I am prefer using a desktop. But M1 on MacBook Air and M1 on the iPad could be so much more. Uh, the M1 iPad needs to run exclusively Mac OS. The other iPads are fine, although I would get rid of the original iPad and the iPad Mini. Plus, give M1 iPad a better name. <laughs> well, it's not, Edward, it's not called the M1. I would disagree that they need to exclusively run Mac OS. I think that Mac OS is still not optimized well for touch, but you can very easily just not use the touch screen on an iPad if you like. Apple's already shown um, comfortability with you know features like Sidecar. You can put Mac OS technically on your iPad, and the touchscreen basically doesn't work. They essentially just deactivate the touchscreen on Sidecar because Mac OS is not really built for touch, and that makes sense. But you can support trackpad, and you can support keyboard. Um, also, yeah, the budget iPad and the iPad mini are great. They just need to get better. I don't think they need to go away. They just need to be refreshed. iPad mini, uh, in my opinion, needs a big design refresh. Budget iPad, it's fine. It can keep Touch ID and the home button and all that. Um, the, the fact that there's a $300 iPad people can buy is great, and obviously it's the most popular iPad. But uh, just allowing people to dual boot, essentially for the same reason Apple was comfortable with boot camp on the Mac and letting people switch it over to Windows for those situations where Windows was uh, more useful or had third-party support that mac os didn't have it wasn't apple admitting that windows was better than mac os it was just apple admitting that there are certain use cases and there are certain examples where people need to be able to switch to windows but of course people still love mac os and use mac os and i think there's a ton of people that were very grateful and very happy about boot camp um, being able to support the different operating systems they wanted to use and i don't think dual booting the ipad is as crazy because Apple actually designs Mac OS. This is not a competitor. Whether you're on Mac OS or iPad OS, it's still Apple through and through. Even if the iPad Pro could boot into Mac OS mode, it's still first party software on first party hardware. There's not like a third party they're enabling. Um, whereas there was a third party they were enabling with uh, Boot Camp. And uh, I know some people have said Boot Camp isn't a thing on uh, M1 Max, but uh, Craig Federighi did say on the record that it's up to Microsoft whether or not uh, dual booting the Mac. And also they're totally comfortable with, um, what's it called? Uh, parallels, uh, virtual machines that allow you to run Windows in a in an emulator. So Apple has nothing against Windows running on the Mac still to this day. They don't have a problem with that. And Craig, as himself said, it's up to Microsoft. If Microsoft wants to optimize Windows to run on the M1 Mac, I bet Apple will be totally fine with it. Um, and this is the quickest, like, shortest amount of time it would take to give the iPad all of its uh, capabilities that could truly take advantage of the M1. And I get it that there's a bunch of people out there that are just like, no, you just make iPad OS better. But it's been 11 years, folks. And after 11 years, the iPad still does not have a calculator app. So I don't know how long you're expecting us to wait, but I'm sorry. The never-ending list of Mac OS features that iPad OS is lacking is not all going to be fixed within a single year. Um, I have high hopes for iPad OS, emphasis on the difference between hope and expectation. There's a ton of hope that iPad OS could be revamped and given uh, revamped external monitor support and better floating window support and all the great things that iPad OS could be capable of. Um, I have a lot of wishes that iPad OS could be greater, but I do not have a lot of faith a very different term. Hope and faith are not the same thing. I do not have a lot of faith that Apple is going to suddenly do all the things we want iPadOS to be able to do. They're going to do one or two things. Every year we might get one little extra thing, but ultimately it's probably going to take over a decade for iPadOS to be fully elevated to the same level of macOS in terms of capability and the software use cases that people want to take advantage of. So... I wish I wish iPad OS would get better. I'm not saying that Mac OS dual booting is is a more elegant solution than just making iPad OS more capable, but it would definitely be faster considering it's been 11 years and there's still no calculator or a weather app. Like it's taken this long and we still can't even get those basics. It's just like across iOS, 
Mac OS, Watch OS, TV OS. iPad OS is like the most nerfed operating system, in my opinion. Like when it comes to iOS and Mac OS, like I can't think of a ton of things that would take the hardware to the next level. I'm like, there's tons of software on Mac OS that can push the M1 and the M1X to its limits. Mac OS is running on $50,000 Mac Pro with 1.5 terabytes of RAM, and there's crazy Adobe software or 3D rendering software that can take advantage of that overhead. Same thing with iOS. I'm like, yeah, iOS and their crazy applications and the gaming performance and the computational side of the A14 chip and the computational photography and videography it's really just making the most of that hardware available same with the watch uh the s6 chip is plenty overkill for what you need on a watch watch os is doing the absolute most it can with the hardware it has available to it but ipad os is just so dang limiting especially when you know there's software out there running off the m1 chip oh it's it's frustrating um, Overachiever, thank you for the bits, says at work at the moment, but have some bits. Thank you. Also, uh, AMD Alien, or Alan, thank you for the Twitch Prime sub. He said, move to YouTube. We can talk more about that later, but I at least wanted to get hype about Quadruple UDC. Um, I do think we'll get one boring hardware announcement at this June Apple event, uh, where what's impressive is the chip inside of it and not the actual device itself, like the Mac Mini. Well, if we, I mean, the last Twitch stream, I think, even was about the M1X Mac Mini. If that gets redesigned, I don't find that boring. Mac Mini design has been mostly unchanged for, like, the past five, seven years. And that's fine, because it's a Mac Mini. It's a little tower. Um, it doesn't need to look different. We're not really going to look at it very regularly. So even if we just get an M1X Mac Mini at this event, I would find that quite a... Um, I would find that quite an interesting piece of hardware, just that it would look different or be narrower or have a slight design tweak to it. That would be interesting to me. I don't I don't need a MacBook Pro for there to be interesting hardware. Like to me, M1X on its own is fascinating enough. Like I agree with that part of your message, Edward, that um, even if we don't get a new redesign and that part of the rumor is just fake and made up for the sake of clicks, and it just turns out that there's now an M1X Mac Mini that looks exactly the same as the M1 Mac Mini, if that came out, no redesign, I would still be super interested in that. I would buy it like as soon as possible. I would want to see all the performance tests on that. I would be super duper excited um, just because M1 is insanely powerful for the class it serves. And to s know how fast it could get with high performance, with twice the high performance cores instead of four, it's now eight. That, that in itself would be fascinating. Uh, S6 is future-proofing, everything to avoid Series 3 situations where you'd need to reset for every update. Yeah, I agree. It's it's not a terrible idea to give a lot of overhead in your silicon. Um, what's not a good idea is to nerf that silicon with the software that the hardware is running. I don't think watchOS is nerfing the S6 chip. I think watchOS 7 or watchOS 8, which we will find out about in less than a week, is probably going to make the absolute most of the S6 chip. Um, or the S5 chip, because a lot of people probably bought the Apple Watch SE. So iPadOS, I do truly see as nerfing, because there's this insane hardware. And we have, like, this is a point I saw some people bringing up in the comments, because if you follow me on Twitter, you know uh, I, I went off on a Twitter rampage arguing with probably, I think, three or four people that were advocating that macOS on the iPad would be a bad idea. But I ran some polls... That kind of reaffirm. Whoa, there's a plane flying by. That's cool. It's really low. I'm not going to show you, but it was just lower than I'm used to seeing planes. I was like, what the heck? Anyway, M1 Mac Mini is amazing, Edward. I agree. But there were a lot of people saying uh, the iPad in its in its latest generation, the, the latest generation iPad Pro being advertised almost everywhere with the Magic Keyboard case. There's more pictures of the iPad Pro in a Magic Keyboard case than there are pictures of the iPad Pro without, especially on Apple's website, and it's even at checkout and everything. People were like, the iPad is not a Mac, so it shouldn't run Mac OS, and you know, the, we can't have cross-platform, we can't have dual booting, that's crazy. But a lot of people were saying, the iPad is kind of a Mac, though. It's an it's a Mac in iPad disguise. Because think about it. What makes a Mac a Mac, really? Like, what is our favorite pieces of hardware that turn a Mac into what a Mac is? Which is, in, in this particular example, let's, let's focus on MacBooks, right? Not desktops. Let's talk about MacBook Air, MacBook Pro. 
They've got a solid keyboard and trackpad. And now, of course, our favorite part of the latest Max is the performance, the M1 chip, not just its high speed capability, but also its high efficiency and great battery life. We've got the M1 chip and we've got USB-C with the Thunderbolt port. And we've got biometrics like Touch ID. And we've got a great aluminum premium design that's designed by Apple. It's very clean. We've got glass. We've got aluminum. we got great speakers on our Macs that we love. Um, we love the backlit keyboard. We love the security of the biometrics. The iPad has all these things. Almost verbatim now. The iPad has Thunderbolt. The iPad has the M1, exact same CPU and GPU as the MacBook Air. It's got a better biometric. It's got a better display. It's got great speakers. And now we know, of course, with the accessories, this is a keyboard and trackpad. The iPad really kind of is a Mac. It's just not branded as one. It's 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 a Mac with iPad branding. Um, it's it's really just a Mac that's way better, <laughs> if you think about it in that way. It's got everything that a Mac has and more. It's got so many things that Macs don't have. Between 120 hertz, between Face ID, rear-facing cameras, which can be great for document scanning. I mean, think about the 3D modeling software that's available on Mac OS that's not available on the iPad. There's all kinds of 3D modeling and, and 3D uh, CAD design applications that people can use on the Mac, but Macs don't have the LiDAR scanner, and the iPad has LiDAR, and 3D mapping software. Like, if you guys watch Corridor Digital, they use the True Depth camera system on their iPhones, but they have to use third-party applications that take advantage of the True Depth camera system so they can make 3D models of their faces, and then they have to transfer that 3D data into their PCs so they can actually work on them with pro class editing software. But iPads just have basic webcams. We just now got like an entry level iMac with a 1080p webcam. It took it freaking 30 years, but we just now got 1080p. How long has the iPhone and iPad have 1080p webcams? They don't even call it webcams. They just call it cameras because they're more for just the web. Now the iPad pro has center stage, which I think is by far my favorite feature of the new iPad Pro. Mini LED is cool and all, but you kind of get used to it. Center stage, though, I don't get used to. Like, it's incredible. Like, uh, when you're FaceTiming or when we did that live stream, when it's, like, panning around with you, it's so simple. I get that it's not really on a computational side of things. It's not that complicated. It's just a, a software that's doing face tracking and moving the camera around with it. But it's so fun... And it's so memorable whenever I FaceTime people or whenever I do a live stream of Center Stage on and people make comments about it and people talk about how fun it is. like, And that's something I don't understand why they couldn't bring to a Mac. People are going to FaceTime on the 24-inch iMac all the time. It got announced at the same time. It's t almost twice the thickness of the iPad, so it's not a physical limitation. Why, why can't... I wouldn't I wouldn't be complaining so much if the Macs had more premium hardware, but they still don't. The iPad still wins. And yeah, I agree, it's more expensive. The iPad costs more, but that's all the more reason that it should not be limited by the software it runs. iPad is more expensive. That's why I want it to run the same software of a $50,000 Mac Pro. Um it's it's for the M1 department, I'm not suggesting the iPad Pro should get the M1X or uh, the higher end hardware that the 14 inch MacBook Pro or 16 inch MacBook Pro might get. I'm not saying I'd be against it, but if your concern, like Snazzy Labs' biggest concern, when I talked about how, you know, Apple is more comfortable with Windows on the Mac than they are with Mac OS on the iPad, and I find that bizarre because Apple designed Mac OS, but he was like, it's simple. They wouldn't do that because it would be too good, which I hate that as being an example as to why they shouldn't do something. Apple shouldn't release that because it would be too amazing. <laughs> the, <laughs> the product would be so good, uh, people would stop buying our crappier products. So we shouldn't do that, right? Like, that <laughs> like that's a good reason to not release something. We can't bring macOS to the iPad because it would be so dang good that less people would buy our MacBooks. But my argument, once again, is that the iPad is more uh, expensive. So you wouldn't really be cannibalizing much, or if you are, you would be making more money. So, okay, maybe people are buying less MacBook Airs 
and more people are opting for iPad Pros, but the iPad Pros are going to cost a heck of a lot more because you can upsell people on the $350 keyboard case. You can upsell people on the $130 Apple Pencil. You got $200 cellular options at checkout. None of that stuff is available on the Mac to upsell people on. You can maybe upsell people on one $70 dongle. So Apple, as we've seen throughout history, is perfectly content cannibalizing products if they can get you to spend more money. The the pr the classic prime example from my end is the iPhone cannibalized the iPod. Right? There's no question there. That That's not a debate. That's a fact. iPod sales went down after the iPhone came out because more people were comfortable buying an iPhone over an iPod. So why was Apple comfortable killing off their best-selling product? Well, because the iPhone was more expensive than the iPod. Apple could get you to spend more money. It's the same exact thing with the iPad Pro here. They can get you to spend more money on an iPad setup than they can a Mac. So I don't think cannibalizing the Mac is a good reason for the iPad to not have an optional Mac OS boot up method. Mr. Lol, thank you for the Twitch Prime. Up here, Matt Apple donated 10 bits. I have not touched my Mac after getting the 12.9 inch iPad with Magic Keyboard. Only complaint is I can do CAD and 3D modeling, but cannot do rendering and materials and realistic results. I'm guessing it's a software limitation. I could be wrong, but I, I can think of countless software things that people run into. 100 bits from AMD Alien. Thank you. It says, are you going to buy a MacBook Pro 16-inch if they revamp it at quadruple UDC? Um, God, it, June is such a busy month. Today's the first day. Um, for those who don't know, <laughs> this is eventually going to answer your question, uh, AMD Alien. But... Uh, I'm picking up my best friend who's just getting out of the Air Force after four years, and I haven't seen him uh, since before the pandemic, um, long before the pandemic. I'm picking him up on Thursday, and then we have a camping trip later this week, uh, and then we have quadruple UDC on June 7th, and then I also do EV news. So I'm covering the Tesla event on June 10th, which we still don't know what time it is. I'm guessing it's going to be late in the day, but Elon hasn't told us what time it's going to be. And then I'm going to be, after that, I'm going to be helping my parents move out of state. They are retiring like in a couple days. Both of my parents are teachers and they've been working for like 30 years and they're just about to retire. And I'm going to have to take like over a week off to help them move. And I don't know what I'm going to do for content. I want to pre-record videos, but I don't have a ton of video ideas for when I'm going to be away. So I don't know when the MacBook Pros, if they get announced on June 7th, are going to start shipping. But if they start shipping when I'm out of town, um, I might have to ship them to my parents' place. Or I might have to ship them to my, my friends that live near me because then at least it's not going to be a package sitting on my front doorstep for like days at a time. Yeah, Mike can run the channel. He can take over for me. Um, the The benefit is you get some more clout and publicity, Mike. The downside is you will get no money. <laughs> you will not get paid at all. So I'd appreciate it. Um, anyway, I would love to check out... If they redesign and release the M1X MacBook Pros on June 7th, yes. The, the short answer is at some point, yes. I would love to check them out. I would love to buy them and review them. I don't plan on keeping any MacBooks of any kind. MacBook Air, MacBook Pro. I after reviewing the M1 MacBook Air, I was very impressed with the performance and the in the efficiencies and I'll just be like and I was just like this is amazing, but a laptop does not fit into my ecosystem very well. Um you know why? Do you want to know why a laptop doesn't fit? It's cuz I already have one. And I love the iPads, I love their hardware. Um if it just comes to basic tasks like i've i've been saying for years that um the ipad has been a mac replacement for tons of people not everybody there's pros like me that are like yeah it's not working yet um there's still a bunch of things i need a mac for but people like my parents or people like uh my grandma or even my sister if you're just like social media youtube watching movies checking email looking at photos using Facebook or Twitter, whatever you want to use, the iPad is great. I would argue the iPad is better in a lot of ways. So better biometric, better display, um, more fun. I find iPad OS, as limiting as it is, it's very optimized. You know, It's very fluid and it's very natural compared to Mac OS, which very quickly is always very cluttered because you have all these different windows. You know, I got Twitter and Safari and OBS open right now, and it's all very clunky with Mac OS and Finder. And the iPad 
yeah, you you only need an Air for that. Exactly. You could you could probably get away with a budget iPad for those things. It's a lot less fun because there's no stereo speakers and you still got a home button and it's you know non laminated display. But an iPad is enough for a ton of everyday consumers and for the basic laptop tasks. Whether it's I want like a slightly bigger screen to watch content on on the couch or watch it in bed like me and my wife we want to watch a tv show and we don't feel like going to the living room we just want to hang out on the bed um you want a laptop for those things or for for finance stuff you want to check your bank accounts or you want to pay bills having face id to unlock all of those apps instead of having to rest my finger on the touch id sensor is so much better and i use my ipad for work obviously i do my all my thumbnails on it and and it's way better at photo editing than i think a mac is because you have a stylus and you have a touch screen and you can rearrange everything whereas doing that with a keyboard and mouse i would say is like a step backwards but so i know i'm not going to ditch my i what i'm trying to say is i'm not in favor of ditching my ipad just so i can have a macbook just because mac os can do some more pro class applications in my ecosystem with my workflow, it makes way more sense for me to have a very powerful M1X or better desktop that stays on my desk. I have not run into a ton of situations where I'm like, I want to edit this high resolution video, but I want to do it in the bedroom or I want to do it on the couch. I'm fine having a dedicated work environment where my high class editing stuff is and then my more casual consumption stuff I can take with me. iPad is... I'm close to saying it depends heavily on the person, but the iPad Pro is a better laptop than the MacBook Air in many ways. Um, not in all ways, but in many ways it's better. So I'm not comfortable ditching the iPad for a MacBook. And because of that, I don't want two laptops. I don't want like a work laptop and a work iPad. Oh no, like a work laptop and a casual laptop. I don't, I don't need two laptops, one for work, one for casual stuff. And that's what, if I were to opt for the 16-inch MacBook Pro um, redesign with the M1X chip and the legacy ports and stuff, then I would have two laptops, basically. Because my iPad Pro, because it has a keyboard and a trackpad, I consider that a laptop. Um, iPad Pro is far from perfect. No, it's definitely not perfect. The hardware, I would say, is pretty dang close. There's some nitpicky things I would... I would argue that the iPad needs, but um, for the most part, the hardware is pretty dang close to flawless. You've got high refresh rate, you've got high dynamic range, you've got great cameras, center stage is amazing, you've got 4K at 60 cameras on the back, you got ultra wide, you got LiDAR, you got Thunderbolt now. The speakers on the iPad Pro still amaze me. It's insane how loud the iPad speakers get. Um, the design I find amazing because there's no notch, there's no chin, there's black bezels. There's Face ID. Um, the software is, however, just so, so far from perfect. It's flawed. It's for a, for a pro class workflow, for something that has Thunderbolt in the M1 chip. iPad OS is fine for something like the iPad Mini or the budget iPad. And basically the iPad Air as well. For that market, someone spending $300 to $500 on a tablet, iPad OS fits that market great. Because if you're on a tablet, you're maybe doing some photo editing, maybe some light video editing, you want a bigger screen, you want split screen multitasking, you want picture in picture, some note taking, you know, iPad OS covers the basics, but we're running that basic software that's really good for $400, $300 iPads on iPads that now go up way past $2,000. If you go to the checkout of the iPad Pro and you max it out, every option they ask for, you click yes, it's close to $3,000. No joke. Mini LED with cellular, which is, I, I know it's technically 5G. I just hate saying the term 5G because I despise it so much. Sorry about the Starlink lag. I can see it. Um, okay, so mini LED, 12.9 inches, magic keyboard case, cellular, Apple Pencil, 2 terabytes, it instantly jumps up to like over $2,800. But you're still running software that's optimized for like a $300, $400 iPad. There's like almost no differences in software capability between those two. Which Apple probably sees as a benefit because they're like, yeah, all this great power on a $300 iPad. But it's, it's not that great power. You still can't have like multiple media sources playing simultaneously. 
which is a huge bottleneck. I saw someone bring that up in Discord, and it is something that I notice on the iPad pretty regularly. Like, if you're in a Zoom call, you can't play a YouTube video because the Apple, like, uh, the iPad OS has to pause when there's a separate media uh, output playing. It's like, no, I can only do one at a time. It's like, it's, it's one of those features from iOS that Apple is still carrying over. So... All right, I'll catch up with the chat here. Matt Apple, thank you for the bits. Definitely still confused if I should wait for a desktop device now that I have the iPad. It seems so redundant to get a MacBook. I agree. If you're spending well over $1,000 on your iPad setup, what's what, what's the point? What, what's the point in spending another $2,000 on a different laptop that has all these hardware disadvantages? I would much rather just have one laptop that has both of the best software uh, platforms available. Yeah, for 95% of people, iPad OS is enough, but I would argue that the M1 iPad Pros are not for the 95%. The the 2 terabyte iPad Pro, any iPad Pro that has the M1 chip is for that top 5%. 95 I would say 95% of people should be opting for the iPad Air or lower for the basic stuff. Um so I, I I think that top 5% is being limited by the OS. Let's see. AMD donated 100 bits. Video ideas I would like to see. iPad versus MacBook. Uh, revisit Mint. Uh, your top accessories for iPad or Mac. If really bored, Apple Watch Series 7, iPhone 13. Yeah, there's something that sounds like a great video idea that's actually much more complicated than you'd think. Um, like comparing Mint to other cell phone companies is very difficult to do, especially because you don't want to have to buy a bunch of different cell phone plans. And if you're not going to buy them and try them out, then you're just basically repeating what other people have said. You're just saying, okay, this person said this service is pretty good. Okay. Um, iPad versus MacBook. Uh, that might be a decent one, but I, I feel like I already bring that up in a lot of my videos, just kind of already. Um and it's also going to get dated very quickly. Once quadruple UDC happens, iPad versus MacBook might be very different. Um, let's see. I feel like the concept for an iPad OS Surface Studio doesn't make sense. It seems like the touch dominant interface for a desktop would be a pain to use without having to stand up. I don't think the suggestion was to make iPad OS exclusively on that device. I'm pretty sure. The concept that I was throwing out there, and many others were as well, was that when the Surface Studio was in the upright position, it would be running Mac OS, and then when you pivot it downward and it's flat, it would be iPad OS. So you'd basically have the advantages of Mac OS and the advantages of iPad OS in one product. I would still be very interested and curious if Apple made something like that. You have your Mac Mini as the base, and then your Mac Mini is holding up this big screen that looks like an iPad. And when you hold it upright, it's a Mac. And when you swivel it down, it would be a Mac. Uh, it would be an iPad. Um, then you would get the best of both. Let's see. So, Drew, is your ILD, uh, is your ideal setup an M1X iPad Pro, which dual boots Mac OS? Uh, not really, because I'm still in favor of desktops. Um, I I wouldn't. I obviously I would love it if I could dual boot Mac OS on my iPad, because then it would it would make getting a MacBook uh, less necessary, and I could do high professional grade video editing on it. But for day-to-day -day stuff, I am still going to be around here. I'm still going to be in my house. Um, that's just where my wife is working, and that's where I'm working. So my ideal setup would still be my dream iMac. I have not swayed from that. It's not that I don't want that anymore. It's just that I don't think it's going to happen after seeing the 24-inch iMac right off camera here. Um, I still want a 32-inch thin bezeled, chinless, black bezeled iMac with the most powerful Apple Silicon available at a reasonable price with Face ID and 120 hertz. That's that's still my dream. But when it comes to my go-to laptop, uh, yeah, iPad that could dual boot into Mac OS that way, the hardware inside of it is much more capable than it is currently. That would be great. But um, it's not like I would ditch my desktop if that was an option. Um, well... Maybe I would if there was still no Dream iMac available. Maybe I would just opt for the M1X iPad that could dual boot into Mac OS, but I don't think that's going to happen. I'm so in favor of it happening, but I know Apple's going to be arrogant and stubborn about it. And we're 
at quadruple UDC, they will probably just announce that iPad OS lets you put widgets in other places on the home screen now. They'll be like, yeah, widgets can go anywhere. You're welcome. Here's this new one weird Apple Pencil feature. And then all the millions of things that we want iPad OS to do that it still can't will still not be available. And there will still not be a calculator. Come on. Oh, heck no. I was never going to keep the 24 inch iMac. Heck no, never. That was never up for discussion. But thank you for the bits. I'm just not 100% they would want a full desktop Mac OS on iPad. I I believe that when you're charging $2,000 or more for something, that it makes sense for it to have some type of software exclusives over, you know, the $300 iPad. Um, I understand what is flat. It runs iPad OS, but in order to access something like the notification shader control center, you would need to reach across a 25 to 30 inch screen. No, no. You would, well, when it's flat, it wouldn't be that hard to reach across. It's a big, it's like Iron Man. You got that big screen that you're interacting with. It's a giant display. It may not sound ideal for you, but I, I could see a ton of people opting for that. I would be interested. Because the main reason I like using my iPad alongside my Mac is because photo editing and vid video thumbnail design is way better on the iPad uh, than the Mac. So if I could have one device that I could fold flat and then do my video thumbnails and mask with a giant canvas like that, and I'm sure artists would love having a giant digital canvas that they could draw on and get a lot more precise with, they would appreciate that. Yeah, Control Center is way over here, but... You might have to tinker it a little bit. I'm not saying don't change anything about iPadOS when you put it on a 32-inch screen. You can tinker it around a little bit. On Windows, you would still have to reach to one corner or something to tap the settings and open up that window and change preferences and stuff. You could do something else. I don't know. You could put some widget on there, some overlay pop-up that changes settings. You can tinker it. Um. So yeah, never never keeping the 24-inch iMac. I, I knew when I ordered it I was not keeping it. What is the point to the MacBook Air if the M1 iPad could actually put into macOS? I'll tell you, Edward, because that question comes up a lot. Uh, the MacBook Air would be substantially cheaper and lighter. You know a huge downside to this 12.9-inch setup here? Oh, I was just picking it up now. It's insanely thick, and it's way, way heavier than a MacBook Air. Also, some people don't like this... Uh, Magic Keyboard case, because look at how it smudges. Look at the oils. There's a lot of differences between a MacBook Air and an M1 iPad Pro. For one, in order to get an equivalent iPad that would be running Mac OS in this scenario, that's a 13-inch display that has a keyboard and a trackpad, you would have to spend about $500 more. Okay, because the iPad Pro with the M1 chip starts with 128 gigs, MacBook Air, is $100 cheaper at the beginning and ships with 256 gigs. And the iPad Pro mini LED, which is the only way to get the 13-inch size, is $1,100. You have to spend another $100 to get it to 256 gigs. And then you have to spend $350 to get a Magic Keyboard case with it. So you're talking about a $1,500, $1,600 alternative. Yeah, I can do more. I think it'd be worth it if you're asking me, like, should I opt for the iPad Pro in the scenario that it can dual boot Mac OS? I'd say, yeah, you got a better display, you've got better contrast ratio, better dynamic range, higher refresh rate, better biometric. But I don't think that would cannibalize the MacBook Air because the MacBook Air with an educational discount is $900, has more storage. And if you're the type of person that's comfortable spending $1,500, that means that uh, for the same price of a 256 gig iPad Pro, you could get a 512 gig or I don't know about maybe not one terabyte, but you could get substantially more storage on the MacBook Air and it would be way lighter and it would probably be less smudgy and not have as many oils and, and collect as much crap as the Magic Keyboard case does. And the MacBook Air would have two Thunderbolt ports. The iPad Pro would just have one and a charging port on one side, but... I agree the iPad would be the better deal, but I would definitely agree there's a ton of differences in price and differences in features. It's like everybody acting like, well, if it ran macOS, what would be the point of the Mac? Where was your logic with the iPhone 12 versus 12 Pro? Those are very similar. Why doesn't everyone just opt for the 12? 
Well, it's because the 12 Pro has some features or has some design characteristics that people prefer over the 12. These are called options, different configurations. And Apple's okay with having different sizes and different tiers of iPhone and iPad and Mac because, yeah, MacBook Air also has a headphone jack. Thank you. That's another good example. iPad Pro wouldn't have a headphone jack. Um, even if it did cannibalize the MacBook Air, that's not a reason it shouldn't happen. Uh, exactly, because Apple would make way more money on the iPad Pro. If there were more people spending $1,500 or $1,200 on iPads instead of opting for $1,000 MacBook Airs, Apple's still winning there. Apple is still selling more products with better features and more uh, money is being generated. So that's, yeah, I agree. That's not a good reason to not, <laughs> that's a terrible reason to not do it. Um, Apple getting macOS on the iPad would allow several developers to get around App Store rules. Eh, I don't think much because it's not a huge demographic of uh, the iPad. We're talking about it only being available on certain iPads. Like the market share of M1 on iPads. I mean, it's the same. It, with that logic, they just shouldn't sell Macs because, you know, developers can... If Apple sells more Macs, there's more Apple platforms that have been made that developers can't get around, uh, that developers can get around App Store rules. The fact that Mac OS still supports that now means that it's not, it wouldn't hurt anybody to sell a more expensive option that also allows that. By that logic, the M1 Mac Mini is hurting the App Store. You know, it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't hold up. I do see the point is still having the MacBook Pro around M1 iPad both offer two totally different approaches. I agree. They're, they're very different from each other. They're separate. Um, it's not about one being better than the other. The MacBook Pro would have some advantages and the iPad Pro would have some advantages. I personally would think the iPad Pro would be worth it, um, but a lot of people probably wouldn't. If you're looking for just the cheapest possible laptop, the iPad Pro would not be your go-to. It would still be the MacBook Air. That wouldn't change with this scenario we're pitching. Um, don't forget the 720p webcam. Yeah, iPad has center stage. If you want to talk about a pointless product, the M1 two-port MacBook Pro. That I will agree with you, Michael. I think the only reason they have that around is so that they can say the MacBook Pro starts at $1,300. But in my opinion, having tested the M1 with fans and having tested the M1 without fans does not make a huge difference. I don't. I don't get the point between having a two-port MacBook Air and a two-port MacBook Pro. They're so dang close. There's so little differences between the two. All you have is the touch bar, which is apparently going away anyway, um, and slightly better battery life. But the MacBook Air battery life was insanely good, in my opinion, anyway. I would much rather just Apple have a 14-inch. I'm, I'm not saying I want the MacBook Pro to be more expensive. I just think that the differentiating factor between MacBook Air and MacBook Pro should be the port's and the thickness mainly. They're already doing the thickness now, but I'm saying all MacBook Pro should have four USB-C ports, essentially. Or the legacy ports, if they bring those back. HDMI, SD card slot and stuff, that's fine. But MacBook Air, fine. You can have two USB-C ports and a headphone jack, and that's it. Not a lot of I.O. But then the MacBook Pros, they have four USB-C ports, or they have three USB-C ports and HDMI and SD card. And the Pros get more ports. Okay, Apple makes you spend more money to get your old ports back. Fine. But having... A MacBook Air and a MacBook Pro that both have two ports and they both have the M1 chip and they both have the headphone jack and they both have pretty much the same display. I find that very redundant. It's far more redundant than the idea of having just iPad Pros allow for Mac OS dual booting. Um, those have so many differences and there's so many different pros and cons to going with one over the other. MacBook Air would still be cheaper. iPad Pro would be substantially more expensive to get the same specs but it would be a very capable piece of hardware. Um, and if Apple is worried about it cannibalizing higher-end Macs, like Macs higher uh, that it cost more than the MacBook Air, um, then you just don't give the iPad the M1X. It's that simple. You just keep the M1, keep the same series of chips that the uh, MacBook Air has, which will probably get the M2 chip later this year or next year. And the iPad Pro can get M1, M2, but it never gets higher than that. And the MacBook Pros, which are going to be around the same starting price of the iPad Pros, if not less, um, those are going to come with way better performance. Those are going to be M1X 
or M2X or M1T, they're going to have the high performance cores that the iPad doesn't. So I don't see it cannibalizing much because if you just care about Mac OS and performance, the MacBook will still be the better way to go. Um, the iPad Pro is is just going for a demographic that doesn't care about the the weight, doesn't care about the price, but wants something with a touchscreen and a stylus. And yeah, I, I think it would make so much sense. I've gone through the argument a million times in my head and it's just so perfect. It would be so great. And I just believe Apple will not do it because... Apple's going to have that arrogant view viewpoint of, nope, iPad OS only runs on iPad. Mac OS only runs on Mac. iPad, not Mac. We can't change it. And I that's going to just throw out this entire... And it's just going to make the iPad Pro insanely overkill hardware for the software, which makes it overall a very difficult product to recommend when things like the iPad Air exist. Um, Avnub is saying iPad OS needs a fundamental rewrite frankly right now it's iOS glorified for a bigger screen and with some desktop features instead it should become touch op optimized Mac OS to remove all of the tiny but number of limitations that the iPad currently has I very much agree I wouldn't be against iPad OS just becoming more capable I just don't believe it will um, I think they'll just people you know the sad thing about this is is that that argument that Avnub just presented has pretty much been the same argument since the iPad first launched. That's what a lot of the people who complained about the iPad way back when it was unveiled in 2010, that's what they were saying, is it felt like an over-glorified iPhone. It was just a big phone. And we're here 11 years later, and it's gotten a lot better. iPad OS has gotten a lot more capable, and it's gained a lot more features over the iPhone, but it's still it's still severely behind Mac OS in regards to functionality, which is why giving it the M1 and giving it a Thunderbolt port is just so unnecessary and so overkill. And the price goes so insanely high now to give it eight gigs of Ram and 16 gigs of Ram and two terabyte storage options and still not allowing pro res and still not bringing your own pro apps. Um, and still not having microphone settings or external webcam support, all this really basic stuff that the Mac has had for, I think over 10 years. Um, yeah, it's, it's very upsetting. Let's see. I'm kind of worried about the lack of software leaks this year. I'm afraid it means the updates aren't too major. Yeah, I'm, I'm worried about that too. It doesn't sound like there's much in store. Um, which means maybe the M1X is all we really do have to get excited for, but either way, I'm excited because Apple events are fun and they have clever transitions and great cinematography and quadruple UDC is kind of Craig Federighi's golden hour. That's where uh, Craig likes to shine and Craig is always funny and does cringy slash memeable things. So I'm always a fan of that. So I I'm just excited to see Craig again and see Tim riffing off each other and in the great cinematography that Apple it does with their events. So it's it's an Apple event nonetheless. I'll get excited about that. I'm just glad I'm available and I didn't have any family things come up on June 7th and they picked a good time for it. Uh, there was a time earlier in the year where I was like, oh no. <laughs> I'm worried that I'm going to be out of town when Quadruple UDC happens. So M1X by itself is exciting enough. So if we don't get any Apple Silicon or any hardware, that's probably going to bum me out a bit in itself just because of what leakers are saying. Now they're making me want to expect it. Um, let's see. Why can't the bezels on the iMac just be the same color of as the actual iMac? I gave I gave you get a blue one, just be blue. Or you can get a silver one, just be silver. I don't get the black and white thing. Well, there's definitely no black, but um, I don't know. I'm imagining the... I don't like the color of the chin, though. That's the thing. So if that was just the entire color around the whole bezel, I don't know. It would still look ugly to me. It looks ugly now, but yeah. I don't know. Mac OS did get a major update last year, despite having no leaks for that, so there's still hope. Well, there was a lot of leaks leading up to that event that they were going to announce the Apple Silicon transition. I just remember us being surprised that they didn't have any hardware to showcase that transition, which I thought was a little bizarre. Um, I still do to this day. They, they did basically the exact same thing they did for the Intel transition. They announced a dev kit, and that was it, which I thought was kind of weird of modern-day Apple to be like, so every Mac we're selling right now is about to become dated, 
and we're about to transition to our own silicon and our own silicon is going to be substantially better and it's coming later this year and they announced the transition but there was no hardware for us to pre-order or buy or get pumped for other than just everything's going to transition and there wasn't other than that mac mini dev kit it was like okay that's it so i found that weird but yeah there was a lot of talk that um w there wasn't much anticipation that mac os would get a big software redesign but there was a lot of talk that macs would be switching to their own silicon um did you hear about johnny ive designing the imac and if so what are your thoughts i don't i didn't read too much into that um johnny ive is a big part of apple's history but i we don't know how much of the involvement acting like the 24 inch iMac was designed by one person is ridiculous. There's obviously probably dozens, if not hundreds of people that went into the design and, um, you know, I don't know the, the scale of his involvement. It's possible that Johnny, I've just designed like the dock and he worked on the dock or he worked on the flat back and that was it. Um, but Johnny, I've, I, 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 no, he's a big part of Apple, but you know, there's there's all kinds of design attributes that he was a part of that I was not a huge fan of. You know, like I didn't Johnny Ive seemed to be a lot about form over function. And I think there's a good balance to to be had. There's a lot of times you can have, you know, there's a lot of times I'm willing to sacrifice function over form, but um I think you can go too far. And uh I don't the, the, the frustrating part with the 24-inch iMac isn't so much that they went with form over function. It's more about that I don't like the form. <laughs> they could There could be all kinds of functional limitations to a bezel-less, chinless iMac. There would be all kinds of things like, oh, because it's so thin or because we couldn't do this, now we got to put the headphone jack on the side or we got to get rid of the SD card slot or we got to get rid of the Ethernet port. But the front could look really good, and I'd be like, cool, I'm fine with that. Um I just happen to not like this form. So it, it has nothing to do with function over form or form over function. It's just they, they chose a design style I don't like. Let's see. Would Apple Music get a whole new UI redesign, or is it just the Dolby Atmos lossless audio feature update? I don't expect it to get a whole new UI design. I'm pretty sure Apple showed in the newsroom post that once the lossless audio feature comes out, it'll just be a little badge under that album that if it supports lossless, it's like, hey, I support lossless, by the way. Do you think there will be something in quadruple UDC that points to where Apple is heading in regards to Apple Glass, or is that going to be reversed for a separate event this or next year? Right now, if Apple is letting Oculus have all this area all to itself. In the grand scheme of things, Oculus does not have a large area. In, in, this, in the market of accessories and revenue, VR is still relatively small. Um, I don't think Apple Glass is around the corner, for the record. Um, the the sad thing about Apple Glass is people seem to always be thinking it's around the corner, and they've been thinking it's around the corner for years, literally years now. I remember thinking people uh, were were right about Apple Glass coming out soon in 2017 and 2018. I recall people saying, oh, maybe 2019, oh, maybe 2020. Now we're in 2021, and it's like, oh, maybe 2022. And it's just been going on and on and on. And um, Snapchat just unveiled their new version of Spectacles with augmented reality. And it's very limited. And I, I know that Apple could probably make something a little bit better than Snapchat, but I still think that the tech is not ready yet. Um, so no, I'm just going to go into Quadruple UDC saying don't expect any augmented reality or virtual reality stuff. Um, Apple has expressed very little interest in that demographic um, over the past few years both for the iPhone and the iMac and the, and the Mac in general. And they just don't express a tremendous amount of interest there. So um, do you think Apple hardware is better now that Johnny Ive is gone? Uh, yes and no. I mean, there's certain things that obviously I think the 24 inch iMac is a step backwards in regards to aesthetics. Like I think this, I still have seen tons of pictures of the old iMac that it replaced, and I think it looks cooler. And I still look at my desk, and I see the iMac Pro, and I think that looks way better. Um, but the Apple Silicon is insanely better. Like, you know, the M1 chip is obviously substantially better than anything Intel could ever make. So um, performance, also, I love the iPad Pro in its current form. I like the 
I like the uh, iPhone design. I like the idea of the Apple Watch going in the squared off design. I think AirPods Pro look great. Um, I think AirPods Pro look better than OG AirPods. I, I will take these uh, with ANC with with these every day. And uh, AirPods Max, I had a lot of issues with them and with their pricing and their capability. But if we're just talking in terms of design, I think AirPods Max look great. I love AirPods Max. I, I think they're very iconic looking, very cool looking. Um, but yeah, Johnny Ive hasn't exactly been that long. Uh, butterfly keyboard is gone, which is good. I didn't mind the butterfly keyboard. I didn't really have issues with it, but I didn't hate the magic keyboard design either. So I was like, um, I was one of those people that didn't have an issue with the touch bar or the butterfly keyboard, but I know a lot of people did. So I'm fine with them ditching it. Um, let's see. I don't think we will see designs that didn't have high Ives hands in them until around 2023 at the earliest. He probably approved early versions of the iPhone 12 and the AirPods Pro and the new Apple Watch coming out this year. It's impossible to know. We can speculate endlessly. I think there's a bunch of stuff that wasn't designed that long ago that he probably was not involved with. Like the iPhone 12, I don't believe. I remember when the leaks of that started coming out. It was right after he announced he left that they changed their design layout. I mean, we can go back and forth all day, but I don't think I, I don't think it's going to take that long. And what what does it mean for his hands to be in it? Like, did he see it once in a room and he didn't instantly hate it? Does that mean he was part of the design for it? Like, I don't know. It, it's pointless. Um, I love the AirPods Max design. I think it looks great. I don't think it's a good price. And uh, I don't think it, it's a good deal. And I wouldn't recommend them. Mine were broken. Um, but the design overall, I had very little issues with. The case design was stupid. The the little smart battery case thing that looked like a bra. Yeah, that that they could get rid of. Um, but the look of them, just just how they felt on my head and how, and how they looked as, in regards to over-ear headphones. I thought they looked iconic and memorable, and I, I, I dug the look of them. And I would definitely recommend them if they were like four hundred dollars or less. Um, they would be totally worth it. But for five fifty with lightning and no lossless support, and um, you have to buy the audio jack, the lightning cable separately. And I don't, I really don't like that they have lightning. Um, the departure was announced in June twenty nineteen. He didn't officially leave until the end of twenty nineteen. So everything in twenty twenty definitely had his fingerprints on it. We don't know. Not definitely. There's a bunch of divisions that he's not. You know, if he if he knew he was leaving, <laughs> the amount of involvement. All I'm saying is we don't know. I'm saying you, you can't know for sure that he was definitely involved with certain things or not. There could have been a completely different design approach that Apple wanted to go with with the 2020 iPhone that they ended up scrapping once Johnny left and decided to opt for the squared off iPhone 12 design once he was once he was out of there. So we don't know. That's all I'm saying. It's pointless to act like we know for sure. Um, let's see. Do you think if they released an iMac Pro, Apple will just throw the MacBook Pro specs in it and call it a day? If so, I'd be so bummed because I would want a lot more power graphically. Well, you don't know how good the MacBook Pro specs are. M1X could very easily outperform every version. You know, the graphics cores on the MacBook Pros are rumored to be between 16 and 32. 32 graphics cores. Do you know how many the M1 has? Eight. I know it's not exactly linear, but we're talking like around a four times per, uh, graphics boost on the MacBook Pros which I think would likely outperform knowing how close the M1 is to my iMac Pro. Um, it's very possible the M1X could outperform every tier the iMac Pro had. Um, so all I'm saying is we don't know for sure what the performance could be. Um, maybe just people don't like the idea that the iMac is going to have, yeah, but the individual performance of those cores. It's like a 1,000 graphics cores that are really, really low-powered and weak compared to the eight graphics cores in the M1. Um we're talking about the same series of chips, M1 versus M1X. It's not M1 versus NVIDIA. That's, yeah, completely different architecture. Are you surprised the squared-off design has come this far, like going to iPhone TV remote, et cetera? No, I, I always had the feeling they were going to go back to that once the iPad Pro switched to it. I was like, yeah, they want design symmetry. They want to bring that to everything. 
I'm not shocked. It's it comes in waves. It's like a design phase thing. Like right now, it's all going squared off. In another five years, they might go back to round it off again, just thinner. They could do that eventually. Um, maybe people just don't like the idea of a desktop having the same specs of a laptop, which I would say in this Apple Silicon transition, that might be something you have to get used to, especially with the 24-inch iMac with the same chip as an iPad now. Desktops and iPads having the same silicon. Yeah, that might throw some people off, but um, I think it's more so going to be about why the laptop is insanely overkill uh, for what it is insanely good value and the desktop is just a modest spec boost it's better than the iMac it's replacing way better graphics way better cpu and gpu um you're getting an upgrade nonetheless on the desktop department apple silicon is not going to be slower than anything it replaces you can count on that so don't feel like if the bigger iMac gets an m1x chip that's somehow bad that's that's a worse thing in some way shape or form um Let's see. You have a lot more watts available on a desktop and you aren't taking advantage of them. Yeah, that's that's part of the form over function thing. You know, the 24-inch iMac has a lot more watts to pull from, but it's not really going into the M1 and making it run way faster. Um, but the point is it'll it'll still be an upgrade. It's, it's definitely faster than if Apple did not switch to Apple Silicon. Um... Yeah, th there you go. Don't think of the M1X iMac as using a MacBook Pro chip. Think of the MacBook Pro as being a portable iMac. <laughs> it's all relative. The M1X chip will be substantially faster than the M1. It'll be substantially faster than any iMac before it. Um, that's the thing you should focus on. Not so much that, oh, I don't like this iMac because it's the same speed as this cheaper MacBook Pro or the smaller MacBook Pro. It's like, just let the MacBook Pro fan have his overhead. Let him have his day, and you can just appreciate that you got a much faster Mac that's now thinner and cooler looking. With When it comes to the iMac, I, I don't think we can all argue that it's all about function over form. The whole point of an all-in-one is about how it looks cooler and looks cleaner. I just happen to think the look they went with with this iMac is not very good. But um, the... The, the fact is, an all-in-one iMac is still going to prioritize how cool it looks. You know, even before Apple is transitioning to Apple Silicon, like the iMac Pro, there was a lot of form over function with when how thin can we make the iMac. And from the side view, it's very narrow. I still think that the older iMac still looks plenty thin from most angles, especially from the front. It looks very narrow and very thin, and it's not super heavy. Um, it was still a massive upgrade over the last iMac um, from the edge actually if you're just looking at the end point the the iMac because of the optical illusion of it being bended out the back um, the the older iMac looks a bit thinner than the 24 inch iMac because the 24 inch iMac is flat on the back so it's just this big you know 11 mil 11 millimeter chunk on the side and I get that it's technically thinner once you accommodate for the back as well but yeah if they release the M1X in June, will they release the M2 in October? Seems like there isn't much of a gap between them, no. Um, I think people are misunderstanding the differences, at least if you've been keeping up with the Bloomberg reports, which I'll, I'll give Bloomberg some credit. They're pretty reliable with this stuff. You know, Mark Gurman was the one who said that the iMac and the iPad would get the same chip before everybody else did, and he was right about that. So I kind of believe his sources when it comes to Apple Silicon. And he's he mentioned that... Um, M2 chip, it's like a different series. It's just like the A13 chip was not faster than the A12X, but the A12X was fitting a different form factor than the M13. So you have your iPhone series of chips, your M8, A10, A11, A12, A13, A14, and then you have your iPad Pros, which are going to want a bit more power. They're going to be less power efficient, but they're going to be more powerful overall. That's where you get your A10X, and those don't happen annually, you know. That's why we never got A11X or A13X. It just went A10X, A12X, now M1. And I think um, M2 is not going to be faster than M1X. It's going to be more power efficient than the M1. And according to Bloomberg, M2 is just improvements on the entry-level Macs. So the M2 goes into things like the Mac Mini, 
the base model one, not the M1X Mac Mini, but like the $700 Mac Mini, the MacBook Air would get the M2, and it would have the same number of high-performance cores, same number of high-efficiency cores, but it would get a couple more graphics cores. At least that's what the Bloomberg report is saying. So the MacBook Air, when that gets refreshed with the M2, that will have uh, same high performance as before, but now it has better graphics, and maybe now it's more power efficient. Um, so it's not like M2 is objectively better than the M1X in every way. M1X is going to be eight high performance cores instead of four, and M1X will be more power hungry, but it'll be more powerful. So different chips for different markets. Um, I still think there's a decent chance of M1X coming out at quadruple UDC and then M2 coming out in the fall and the M2 will be better battery life, better graphics, but not better multi-core performance or anything than the M1X. Uh, I guess what I really want is a Mac Pro in an all-in-one form factor. Well, the Mac Pro fundamentally is supposed to be like a tower. Basically, I'm guessing what you're saying is whatever chip or whatever silicon the Mac Pro gets, you want in an iMac. I can understand that. I would want that too. Um, either way, though, you should assume M1X will be substantially better than every other iMac in existence, including the new 24-inch iMac. Better than every... Uh, M1X is faster than the M1, which is faster than almost every other <laughs> uh, chip Apple makes, so... Think of the X and Z uh, Monte cores as being like i7 versus i3. The next gen i3 isn't going to be faster than a last gen i7, even if it is newer. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. There's different tiers. iPad Pro would get M2. Yeah, if if Apple updates the iPad Pro next year, they probably will in the fall. I'm guessing it won't be in the first half of 2021. Uh, 2022. I think it'll be the second half just because every iPad Pro refresh is over a year apart. It's always like 15 to 18 months apart for each refresh. So the next iPad Pro, when that comes out in the fall of next year, not this year, that will probably have an M2 chip. So we'll have better graphics, but not eight high performance cores and that kind of thing. Um... What would the chip the Mac Pro get? So Bloomberg is alluding to the Mac Pro getting something more powerful than the M1X. I know Nick on the Talos of Tech podcast was alluding to there just being two tiers. You have your efficient tier, and then you have your high-performance tier, and that's it. And the M1X would cover everything. But I don't, I don't think that's enough. I think that for all of the crazy performance of the high-end you know, 28-core Mac Pro, um, you're going to need something even more powerful than the M1X to rival that. So I'm anticipating that will be the third tier. There's two tiers that we are pretty sure about. We know that the higher-end iMac and the higher-end MacBook Pros are going to need something a bit more than the M1. Um, M1 is our base tier. M1X would be our second tier. And then the Mac Pro potentially would get some kind of third tier. And Bloomberg said that one would have between... Correct me if I'm wrong. I think it was 16 or 32 high-performance cores. Give you perspective on that. 32 high-performance cores. The M1 has four. Four high-performance cores on the M1. And the Mac Pro would have 32. So it would be insanely powerful. And in terms of graphics cores, they said between 64 and 128. Something miraculously high. 128 graphics cores, and the M1 has 8. It's an insane amount of upscale, which makes sense as to why the Mac Pro will probably not be ready. Definitely not for the general consumer, and absolutely way more expensive um, than what the general consumer would be willing to spend their money on. So an Apple Silicon Mac Pro, that's why most of us are still expecting it to start around 6,000, hopefully less. Uh, I would be very interested in the Mac Pro if it starts below $6,000. Um, yeah, that's going to be a huge chip footprint-wise. footprint, uh, footprint wise. Mac Pro could have multiple M1Xs with multiple NUMA nodes, maybe. I don't know. It might get its own system on chip that's entirely different from the M1X. That's why it's a Pro, right? It's not for general consumers. But it's meant to be expensive and outperform the cheese grater Mac Pro that they're still selling in every way in graphics and CPU speeds. 
Um, so I would I would be very interested if they can get the price down, which I think there's a chance on because the Mac Mini got cheaper with M1, and um, I think a lot of the cost of the Cheese Grater Mac Pro comes from it being modular, the fact that you can take the whole case off and there's all these little custom switches and stuff that you can pop out, and it's a very big Mac, pun intended. So if they didn't have to make it as modular and they didn't have to make it as large and they could shrink the size down and make it less customizable but more powerful, that, I believe, would make it more affordable. Maybe 5000 ideally less. You know, If they could get it down to 4000 that would be incredible to know that you could get you know, potentially a 16. I'm guessing that the base model wouldn't have 32 high performance cores or 128 graphics cores. So I'm guessing the base model would have something like 16 high performance cores and 32 or 32 graphics cores or something like that. So it would be, it would be very, very powerful essentially for not a terribly expensive machine. You just have to supply your own screen and speakers and stuff. Um, Will Apple begin to move away from Qualcomm for iPhones anytime soon? Yeah, I think uh, 2020, I think it got pushed back. It was going to be next year for a while because Apple bought out Intel's modem business. Um, but the latest reports, I believe, were saying 2023. So it might be like two years. But I know that Apple eventually plans on making their own modems instead of uh, using Qualcomm's. Yeah, Apple said it would take two years to transition from Intel to Apple Silicon, which means the deadline is about a year from today. Um, and the, for the record, the last transition, they did not take uh, the full two years. The transition from PowerPC to Intel, I think, only took one year. They said it would take two, but they did it in less. I predict that they will take longer. I, I don't think they're going to announce all the... Every Intel Mac is getting discontinued next week, although that would be really exciting and cool if it was. I don't think that's going to happen. I think the Mac Pro will still be Intel by the end of this year, um, and we will probably get an Apple Silicon Mac Pro uh, next quadruple DC. Not this one, but the next one. If Apple doesn't add a cellular option to the new MacBook Pros, that will be a huge missed opportunity. I don't know why they don't have them still. Like I don't get why the iPad is so exclusive. Like Why does it get that? Um, anyway, as we're coming near the end of the stream here, I did want to address, I see your messages. Um, what's his name? Joseph. He's been asking this entire stream, um, if I'm switching to a uh, YouTube for live streams, the, the short answer is I have not decided yet. And, um, I am not, uh, I, I ran the polls to see what the audience would prefer, but I did not say that I would do whatever won the polls. I hope I hope people know there's a difference there. Sometimes I may ask for the public's opinion on what I should do for my content production. And I'm not always going to listen to the most popular answer because sometimes what the audience wants is not the best option. Um, but I wanted, to f I wanted to feel it out. I wanted to hear how people were feeling um, because I'm, I'm thinking about it. It's not it's not something I've decided on yet. It's uh I did the center stage live stream uh which could only be done on YouTube. I could not do that live stream on Twitch. And I had quite a turnout. A lot of people showed up and we had fun and there were there's a lot of benefits to streaming on YouTube. I'll I'll admit and there's a lot of people in the comment section that argue why they prefer live streaming on YouTube and there's a lot of people that don't like Twitch. I know that I'm live on Twitch right now, so that's probably what most of the chat is going to prefer. Um, it depends on where you run the poll. Yeah, YouTube obviously gets more votes, but even on Twitter, uh, the results of the Twitter poll were over 50% of people wanted the same thing. It wasn't drastically different. The results on the Twitter poll were pretty much the same. 59% um, of people, about only 1,000 people voted, but 59% of people still preferred I stream directly on the main youtube channel and there's some downsides to that and some upsides as well but um ultimately i don't want to do like i think twitch is better if you were to ask me like i think twitch is a better live streaming platform and it's better built for content uh it's better built for live streaming it's better built for revenue for live streamers and um 
even from the consumer level, like I prefer the picture in picture that Twitch allows. Um, but I don't think I should do something just because I think it's better. Like if, if we put this in the extreme example, uh, imagine if there was another streaming site, not Twitch, let's just call it, I don't know, cow. There's a live streaming service called cow. You know, Drew's brain is going to go random for a second. So I find out that cow is way better because they take 0% of the cut. So everything you guys donate would go directly to me. Twitch still takes a cut. They're just more obvious and honest about it. YouTube's not very obvious about the cut. But um, let's say cow has no revenue cut. It's way better for streamers. The app is way more optimized. Uh, it's better on the iPad. It's better on the iPhone. And I think as a streamer that Cow is the better platform, so I choose to stream on Cow. But you guys, the audience, don't prefer Cow because as a viewer um, or mixer, that would have been a better example now that they're dead. Um, I, uh, You guys as a viewer are like, I don't like Cow. Their app is confusing. I don't want to download this app or I don't like their business or their chat or their user interface is confusing. I'm not comfortable with Cow. So I exclusively live stream on Cow. And only like 10 people actually download the app and watch my streams regularly, right? So I think it's a way better platform. I think it's a way cooler place to live stream, but my audience doesn't agree with me. So I decide, well, I don't care what the audience thinks. I'm just going to do what I want to do. So I keep streaming on Cow, and therefore I don't interact with the majority of my audience. And um, more people feel left out because they're like, well, Drew keeps streaming on that weird website that I don't care about. Um, I've done restream. It's not, it's not very helpful. I know that I could technically stream on both, but um, it's a lot more work essentially. Um, the chat is a lot more complicated to keep up with when you do restream and you stream to multiple platforms. Uh, there's more latency because I have to stream to Streamlabs or Restream server, and then that server streams to Twitch and YouTube. So there's more there's more lag. Um, I used to restream back when I did more gaming content. Um, I used to stream to both YouTube and Twitch simultaneously, and I can tell you it was conf complicated because YouTube Studio works very differently. YouTube Studio wants a certain key and they ask for certain requirements. And every time I set up a stream on YouTube, I have to go into settings and click turn on monetization because for whatever reason, it wants to turn that off by default. doesn't matter if I say always monetize the stream. They'll just go in and turn it off for some reason. Um, they want a different thumbnail and you have to update the title each time. So for me as a streamer, Twitch is easier because I don't have to come up with a thumbnail and I, ha I don't have to copy a new stream key and I don't have to come up with a different uh, URL every time. I can just put, every time I go live, I can just go twitch.tv slash Talos of Tech. And you can always click on that link. And if I'm live, you'll see me. Whereas YouTube is more complicated and it's more clunky. But um, YouTube, people are more generous for some reason. I don't know why. I wish it made sense, but I guess people are less inclined to donate when there's a different currency, like um, bits. People are people are not interested in buying bits and donating them to streamers, even though that system is better for the streamer. That's why I'm comfortable with it. But on YouTube, because when you super chat, it displays it in whatever currency your country is in. Um, people feel more comfortable super chatting. Um, Whenever I go live on YouTube, there's tons of people that'll just donate five, ten bucks, twenty bucks, more, and that almost never happens on Twitch. On Twitch, it's like ten bits here and there, which is like ten cents. And I'm not saying this to try to get everybody to donate. That's not what I'm saying. <laughs> Please don't donate just because I brought it up now. Thank you, Michael, for the bits. I appreciate it. But that's what I mean. Like the most I've seen in recent history is usually like 100 bits. And I'm not trying to say you guys aren't generous. I'm just trying to say viewers feel more comfortable donating on YouTube because they see the number and they get charged in their currency. And that does something in viewers' heads that makes them more comfortable to donate more money. Um, people don't understand or they can't wrap their head around 100 bits as well, which is a dollar. Whereas on YouTube with Super Chat, it actively encourages people you know, do do two dollars, do three dollars, do five dollars, do ten dollars. 
and it becomes very obvious when someone's donated more because the super chat's a different color. It stays on longer. You can type a longer message if you super chat more. Um, so for whatever reason, and YouTube gets a 30% cut of that, uh, which they don't make super obvious, which is why I'm not a fan, but the, the generosity and comf comfortability that viewers have on YouTube makes them super chat more even when the 30% cut is applied. Basically, in my experience of live streaming on YouTube, I make more that way. And it also simplifies taxes. Um, for one, more people watch the YouTube streams than the Twitch streams, which makes sense. YouTube's a larger platform. I have way more followers on YouTube than I do on Twitch. Um, alms for the green core. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. This The point of this was really not to get people to donate. I would hope that's not the message you guys are hearing because I'm still undecided on whether or not I want to switch. I definitely won't switch like without making an announcement about it. Um, I still plan on streaming on Twitch for the foreseeable future. Um, but part of the reason, like this is the last year we're going to have merch sales. I don't know if you guys remember that, but part of the reason we're taking away uh, the Teespring page and not going to have merch anymore is just because Merch sites divide things up into non-employee compensation and royalties, and that complicates taxes a lot more when you have to disclose those numbers separately. And Twitch does the same thing because of Twitch Prime and donations. They have to, I don't know which is which, but they have to separate royalties from non-employee compensation. I think if you support me on Twitch via Twitch Prime, which I'm grateful for, and there's a lot of you guys doing that, thank you, um, I appreciate that very much, but... It makes taxes very complicated uh, because already, like, taxes this year were kind of a nightmare. We had to track Patreon, podcasting, YouTube, and Twitch, and Teespring, and some of those don't want to provide provide uh, 10, 1099 tax forms. Some of them do. Google's actually pretty good about it because whether you guys super chat or whether I get money from ad revenue of people just watching my YouTube videos, it all goes into one price at the end of the year. YouTube just sends me a 1099 and says, this is what you made. It's not two separate numbers. Twitch is two separate numbers. Teespring is two separate numbers. And I've already been streaming on Twitch and I've already been, you know, making a living off of it this year. So there's really no tax advantage until next year. Um, I'm still going to have to report Twitch income uh, for the rest of this year. So there, if, if I do end up switching to YouTube streaming, it, it probably wouldn't happen until next year anyway. Um, or maybe the fourth quarter of this year because I wouldn't want to have a bunch of people still Twitch priming uh, in January. I'd appreciate the thought and the support that goes into it, but if I get a bunch of revenue generated on Twitch, I'm still going to have to report it on my taxes. So if I... I'm not saying I would switch to YouTube January. I'd maybe switch in like September, October. I'm just saying it wouldn't be like tomorrow. Um, Twitch Prime is a benefit for sure. I do make money for free thanks to a lot of Amazon Prime fans. Um, but I'm just saying the amount of money that I would earn from Super Chats and also ad revenue would be a lot higher on YouTube because there's more people watching there. And when I do a live stream on the YouTube channel, uh, I, there's typically going to get, you know, five to 10,000 views on that. Whereas on Twitch, it's never that high, even on the separate channel. Um, YouTube is not separated per channel. So all the money that I make from Talos of EV, all the money I make from Talos of tech, all the money I make from Talos of talks, all of that revenue comes into one pot at uh, the 21st is my payday. The 21st of each month I get paid by YouTube. One check. It's not like every YouTube channel is a separate Google AdSense account. It all funnels into the same thing. So I, I appreciate the simplicity of the payout system Google has. Um, but the, all the super chats and ad revenue I get from my YouTube streams outweigh basically what Twitch makes. So not that money should be everything. I don't I don't want people thinking that's the main motivating factor. I'm switching to YouTube because I'll make more. That's definitely not uh, the main reason I'm thinking about this. The main reason I'm thinking about it is because reporting and collecting all of these different tax documents is frustrating, and it's very time-consuming. And um, we're taking away Teespring, losing money. You know, We make money off of merch sales each month. It's not a lot. It's not like an absurdly high... 
Well, I already told you guys what I made last year. Um, I'll just tell you now. Merch sales make me, on average, about $50 a month. Okay? So, it's not nothing. But, you know, if you guys were getting 50 bucks a month for something, you guys would probably want to keep getting that. But the the frustrations and the difficulty of reporting all of my different tax documents, um, we just decided that keeping around that income source of 50 bucks a month and the fact that you know the, a lot of the merch is probably not super high quality and a lot of people are going to buy it and not wear it or throw it away and it kind of my wife is well aware of um because she works somewhat in the clothing industry and she's she's kind of aware of how much waste is caused by clothing and um merch over time and i don't i never even when i started the merch page i i never wanted to be a youtuber that relied heavily on merch sales because that always annoyed me there are a lot of content creators that are constantly plugging their merch because that's become such a key part of their income and they feel like they need that merch revenue otherwise they're not going to be able to support uh in they're not going to be able to pay their bills so they that forces them to keep promoting their merch constantly and i never wanted that i always on teespring they let you set the prices and i always put the profit margin as low as possible because i was like i don't want to make a ton of money off merch i just want the option to be there if people want to wear merch with my artwork or my writing on it um they can have that um yeah i'm i i get sick of the promoting the merch thing on youtube so i never wanted to be the guy that was like buy this merch buy this merch you know when their new one comes out i'm like okay you know if you wanted one here's one but i always preferred it being the way of like i just wear a cool looking shirt and if you guys want to buy that there's a link in the description i don't have to tell you exactly um i don't watch linus tech tips i, I didn't know he plugged his merch that much i and it's not anything against linus i don't watch that many tech content creators because i spend too much time talking about tech in my life but anyway i i'm not trying to throw shade at linus in in specific uh, you guys know him you guys probably watch way more of his video i can't remember the last time i watched the linus tech tips video it's probably been over a year but um he's by far not the only one he's not he's not the only channel plugging his merch all the time i know very small creators that plug their merch all the time and it kind of gets annoying um and I get it, you know, you got to make a living, you got to do what you got to do. I'm not I'm not saying it's a bad thing to promote merch. I'm not shaming anybody who promotes their merch. I'm just saying from a viewer's perspective, as someone who watches YouTube a lot, it starts to get old very quickly. Um there's a newer channel I just started watching. Well, because this is kind of I'm kind of ranting on the subject. I don't want to throw them out. So I'm not going to say who I just started watching, but there's a somewhat small channel I just started watching. And because he's kind of new and up and coming, he's promoting his merch a lot because he wants to, you know, get his channel off the ground and start generating more income. Um, it's not someone you guys would know. It's not in the tech community. It's not It's not someone I engage with on Twitter or anything. It's not someone you guys would guess. It's like a completely different genre of channel. Um, but there's another guy that's promoting his merch all the time. And I was just like, okay, stop. You know, it, it was like five times within 10 minutes. And I was like, all right, cool it. You know, that's enough. So I'm okay losing out on merch revenue for simplifying taxes. And to bring that back to the Twitch streaming versus YouTube streaming discussion, um, I know that I'm not going to lose money by not streaming on Twitch. Um, so that, that variable isn't even here. To let you guys know, I'm comfortable losing a bit of my income if it simplifies my taxes. And here, I would be potentially increasing my income. So I'm not looking at it as let's stream to YouTube, we'll make more money. I'm just saying if we give up on Twitch, um, I'm not saying delete my account. I'm just saying not really be active on Twitch. It wouldn't result in, I don't think losing out on Twitch Prime would result in me late making less money. Um, there would There's plenty of people super chatting and uh, the ad revenue on YouTube would be way higher than it is on Twitch and the viewership would be higher. And ultimately what I'm trying to do as a content creator is engage with the community best I can. And um, I want to do what you guys want to see that's also honest. I'm not just going to be a puppet that says whatever you guys agree on. If most of my audience thinks the 24-inch iMac looks good, I'm not going to change my mind and say, actually, I love it. It looks good. That's, you know, if I hate something and I don't like something or I want something to happen like Mac OS on the iPad, I'm going to be honest about that because that's how I feel and that's my personality. But when it comes to the platform at which I live stream, I want to be able to be listening to you guys and be like okay 
I, I do see those polls and hold some weight to them. We've got, I think, over 10,000 people voted on YouTube, and over 70% said yes, stream directly, not just on a separate live streaming channel, but on the tech channel directly. Uh, we talked about multi-streaming on both platforms earlier. It's not as simple as it sounds, and uh, it's very complicated to keep up with the chat, and uh, it's a lot more work, and um, it's messy, basically. It doesn't work all that well. I've done it before, for those curious. Yes, there are, there are services that let you stream to multiple platforms at once, but I don't think it's a good solution, uh, personally. It doesn't help the tax argument. Um, and the other concern I've seen uh, people brought up a lot is uh, streaming on the main tech channel hurt because of the algorithm. So that's something I've also thought a lot about. Um, the reason it's not something I'm terribly worried about is that um, the algorithm has not be that the algorithm has not been giving me any favors recently. Um, I don't know exactly why. I don't know what I'm doing wrong or. I don't take it personally because there's tons of YouTube channels that I get tired of and stop watching, but I've been losing a lot of subscribers lately. And that doesn't really bother me too much because I still have enough. And I'm sure I have very inactive subscribers that are still subscribed, but don't, um, don't watch the videos because I can see how many views I get per video and I know how many people are subscribed. So I'm like, okay, there's a lot of people that hit the sub button that don't really keep watching. So it's fine that there's people leaving or there may be people getting just kind of tired of the same old Talos of tech. Um, sorry for the lag. Starlink's looking for dishy at the moment. Um, but yeah, there, there's been a lot of people unsubscribing lately and the views and watch time of the channel have been slacking a bit. Thankfully, it doesn't really matter much because the EV channel is doing so good. <laughs> um, I'm very happy with the success of the EV channel, which is picking up a lot of the slack of Talos of Tech. So I'm not, I'm not trying to... I just don't want to send the message across that, like, guys, Talos of Tech's in trouble. We need your help. Everybody start donating. Like, I don't want everybody to feel like, oh, no. We're we're uh, we're not good. Better start donating more because Drew's gonna lose his channel. That's not the situation. We're fine. Don't don't feel like you need to think about donating or think about helping out. We're we're doing totally fine. I'm just saying the tech channel I think has kind of matured, and the the demographic of people that are kind of interested in that Apple sheep, but also like honest and sometimes go against Apple mentality. We might have kind of reached our max capacity. Um, so there, there's just not a lot of growth going on with the Talos of Tech YouTube channel right now. And I know that if we started live streaming there somewhat regularly and notifying people whenever we're live and that kind of uh, say, um, that would result in people who aren't interested in my videos or aren't interested in my live streams unsubscribing and leaving. And I'm kind of fully prepared for that. I hope you guys know like sub count has nothing to do with your income. Uh, your income is almost entirely based on watch time, not views even. So as long as people are still watching, and I think that the people who are watching now would keep watching, even if I did start live streaming, they might turn notifications off or that kind of thing. Um, but I don't think getting two or three notifications extra a week would make fans of the channel stop watching. Um, but the people that weren't really fans of the channel, that weren't remembering to unsubscribe, maybe they would start unsubscribing, and I'm fine with that. I, I think it's just kind of reached its max capacity now, and the algorithm is not really pushing my videos much anyway. So it's it. I, I'm sure that maybe live streaming directly to that channel might hit my views or might hit the algorithm a little bit, but I'm just saying the algorithm's not helping much now anyway. It's not really helping substantially, which is why, you know, I'd be I'd be chill if, okay, maybe my videos don't get recommended as much, whatever. We still got a very loyal, very uh, uh, happy fan base that I love interacting with and I love talking with and streaming to. So I'm not terribly worried about the algorithm hurting anything. Uh, for the longest time, that's why I didn't stream on my main channel, because I kept thinking, oh, the algorithm, all oh, the algorithm. But then I was like, well, I don't really care about the algorithm. You know, there's all kind of shady, sketchy things you can do on your channel um, that help the algorithm. 
you know, also telling people to click the like button increases the your chances at getting caught up in the algorithm. And I don't do that because I think it's annoying and unnecessary. And if there's a large majority of my audience that would prefer it if I live streamed on that channel and I don't care about the algorithm, I don't want to be a slave to that. I don't want to do whatever the algorithm says I have to do. You know, I I'm not in uh, financial trouble. Uh, even if we lost YouTube entirely, you know, me and my wife would be fine. We have a paid off house. We have no debt, no student loans or anything, no rent, no mortgage. So it's not like we'd be in trouble or anything. Um, if, if income took a hit in any way. Uh, so yeah, I, and there's also lots of people that have said there's, uh, accessibility advantages to YouTube that are not on Twitch. There's people that are hard of hearing or hard of, uh, visibility that say YouTube has this feature that helps me with my disability better than Twitch does. So I noticed that and I go, okay, you know, let's, we sh we sh I should at least think about this. I should consider it because I'm, I'm kind of, I've kind of been swearing off streaming on my main YouTube channel just out of that old mindset of it's not good for the algorithm. And I'm like, why do I care? I shouldn't care about the algorithm. People are leaving the channel. Views and watch time are a bit lower than usual. So I haven't been doing much streaming on the channel. It doesn't seem to be boosting my algorithm much. Like, who cares about the algorithm? There's also several channels I've discovered um, the one I was talking about earlier, so I don't want to say who it is, but there's channels I've seen that have done great with both edited videos and live streams on the same channel. And they've seen growth, they've had great success, and they don't seem to be in any kind of trouble just because they started live streaming that killed their algorithm. Um, and there's also several channel, like, uh, several channels with over a million subscribers that both edit videos and post them that are like 10 minutes or less and they also do live streams regularly and they still have great recommended they still have growth so i'm not completely in the i'm not completely in the field that i think that live streaming kills your channel growth um for one i've already killed my channel growth so i don't care much about that uh, but for two i've seen plenty of channels with millions of subscribers that do it regularly and it doesn't seem to hurt them um they're still growing they're still doing good um, PewDiePie is a great example. <laughs> Speaking of the chair I'm sitting in right now, he does lots of YouTube streams that are hours and hours long, and he does edited videos, and his videos still do great. Maybe he's a bad example because he's like the biggest creator, but he's not the only example. Um, Meet Kevin, I think, is another one. Uh, he has over a million subs and he's live streams and does edited videos all the time. So I've seen plenty of proof that it can work. Um, if I started live streaming and I noticed just like a huge drop off in views and watch time, then maybe I would be like, okay, maybe maybe the concern is real. But as of now, I don't think it would. I don't think it would be a big issue. Um, just do iPhone box giveaways to rope in viewers. Hey, everyone, I'm going to give out this box. There's nothing in it. I love auto-translate subs on YouTube. Watched some nice Apple TV 4K reviews from Japanese French YouTubers recently. Now we need auto-translate audio. Now that would be interesting, yeah. Uh, why do views drop off if you live stream? I don't think they certainly do. I think it's a running theory that a lot of people say happens. I've seen lots of content creators say that they see a drop off in views and the algorithm gets confused if you start live streaming directly. But at the same time, I see a lot of channels that do it and don't seem to have many side effects of it. And they're still growing and they still get lots of views on their edited content. So if I saw a bunch of views and watch time drop off, after I started live streaming exclusively on my YouTube channel, um, I would be willing to change things and maybe go back to Twitch or just stream off my Talos of Tech streams channel, which is all, that's where all these Twitch streams go. Um, after I'm live, I just export them to YouTube and then people can watch them on YouTube, just not live. Um, and I've thought about what if I just live stream from there? That's why I included it as an option in all my polls. I was like, maybe some people want it on YouTube, but they don't want it on the same tech channel. But According to the poll, most people most people want it just on the same channel. They don't want a whole second channel. They just want it to be on the same thing. So um, if that's what most people want, I'm, I'm willing to consider it. I'm not, again, I'm not doing it tomorrow. It, you'll see it coming. I'll make an announcement. I'll make a big deal about it. Um, what are you going to do with that iMac? A bit? You'll just give it to your wife. My wife hates the new iMac. Um, she walked in my office when I first set it up, and she was just like, Nope, I'm done. 
<laughs> my wife loves the iMac Pro too. I was talking about selling it to pay for. I was like, honey, what if the M1X Mac Mini comes out in June and it's like way faster than the iMac Pro? And we're like trying to invest a lot right now. So we don't have like a ton of money set aside for a brand new, super expensive Mac. So I was like, honey, if we sell the iMac Pro, that would cover the price of the M1X Mac, Mac Mini. And she was like, but I like the iMac Pro. That looks cooler. The Mac Mini doesn't have a screen. She was like, I prefer all-in-ones. She was like, I, I want it to be one screen with the computer built in. She didn't. She wasn't into the Mac Mini idea or the Mac Pro idea. I was telling her, I was like, Mac Pro would be really fast. I just have to use my own monitor, and I already have one. And she was like, mm, can you get an all-in-one? And I was like, well, all the all-in-ones have chins and she was like oh i hate chins <laughs> so yeah my wife's not a fan but what are you going to do with that iMac yeah it, it's going back it's it's going in back in the box and then we'll ship it off back to apple um the youtube chats do tend to be more chaotic that's true there's a lot more bots and there's a lot more chaos with the youtube streams but you know there's also more people if we were live streaming on YouTube more, I would I would add more moderators. I would I would probably get some more official people that I know could be there for almost every stream. Um, I would I would load up on moderators so we have a ton of them. Um, uh, just curious, how much do you get from YouTube Premium subscribers? I recently subscribed to YouTube Premium because I'm watching a lot of YouTube recently. I don't know how to tell you the exact number, but more. Um, it's a good thing for content creators uh, because YouTube premium is not based on ad revenue. Uh, it's not based on uh, advertisers. So at any given point, there's a bunch of advertisers spending money on YouTube ads and that changes throughout the year. It's typically very low in January and very high in December. So a thousand views in December can get you a lot more than a thousand views in January. YouTube premium is the same price all year. And I believe from the analytics YouTube gives us, if, you ha if you're a YouTube premium subscriber and you watch my streams or, my, or you watch my videos, um, that makes more money than if you were just watching with ads. Um, so if everybody was a YouTube premium subscriber and watching YouTube, all YouTubers would w make way more. So I don't know the exact number. I think it, cha it, it changes because the ratio of people with YouTube premium watching is always fluctuating. I think it's like 10 or 12% of viewers. But um, it's good overall. Like if you're wondering if YouTube premium hurts content creators, no, it's good. You, everybody should do it um, if, they, if they want to. Don't, don't feel like, oh, I don't want to do premium because it won't help my YouTubers. It's like, no, it's, it'll help us. Thank you. Um, there's just something about Twitch that makes it more welcoming for chatting with the streamer. Yeah, there's a bunch of things they get right. There's a bunch of little details, too. Um, the latency, I've noticed, is lower with Twitch. Um, the emotes that you can use across different streams is easier to do on Twitch than YouTube. Um, I prefer picture-in-picture -picture on Twitch, which YouTube still doesn't support. Like I said, if there was no difference in following, like if I had the same number of viewers and I had... Uh, same amount of revenue on both platforms. I still think Twitch is better, um, but I don't want to do something just because I think it's better. You know, like um, I switched my YouTube videos to 1080p for a while because I was like, oh, this allows me to export faster and I can upload content a lot quicker. And most people watch it at 1080p. But I started getting a lot of comments of people that were like, I watch in 4K. I prefer 4K. I want to watch in 4K. So I was like, all right, okay, if. A lot of people want 4K, then all right, I'll put in the extra time. The videos will come out a little slower. The upload will take a little longer, but at least y'all will get your 4K option that so many people prefer. So I'm willing to bend and and adapt a little bit based on what the viewer wants. I'm not, I'm not the type of guy that's just going to be like, screw my audience. I don't care what you guys think. I'm going to do what I want. You have to live with it. Sometimes I'm like that, but <laughs> mostly I want to be the type of viewer I would want to watch. Um, so I, if, if a bunch of people want it to be a certain thing, then I'm willing to try and adapt. Where's the 8k option? Yeah, really. Is this one of your longest streams? Oh man, not by, not by a long shot. Maybe the, one of the longest tech streams, but 
I will watch it via potato due to lack of Starlink. Hopefully that's soon. Hopefully it's within the like next month or two Starlink comes to Mike. But I appreciate you guys for all of your feedback. Um, I have a feeling that most of you would probably keep watching the streams no matter where they were. So I'm grateful for that. And I'm very um, happy for the uh, community we have and the audience we have here. Yeah, I'll definitely stream Quadruple UDC and everything. Um, and my reaction and the hype stream and all that. So uh, I'm... I'm happy for the future. I think no matter what happens, we'll do great. Uh, the channel will be fine. I, I hope the stream wasn't too much of a downer. Don't worry about the channel. It's fine that people unsubscribe. It happens. It's okay. And uh, I appreciate you all for tuning in. I got some more videos headed your way soon. Tech video will be dropping in an hour or two and then EV later. So thank you all for watching. This is your Apple Sheep here. I'll see you all in the next one. Take care. Bye-bye.